from our normal series in the book of Matthew this morning. And um, it's uh, that season of the year when we celebrate the Lord's birth and we're here in pretty close to the middle of the month. And so I wanted to start working along of that theme of our Savior's birth. And so I'd like you to turn into the Old Testament with me to the book of Micah, uh, to the book of Micah. And uh, not spelled the same as uh, Micah, our dear precious um, Micah that we love and hold dear to our hearts here at Aubrey First Baptist Church. But um, if you uh, go to the book of Psalms and turn right, um, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon, and um, then we get on over into um, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, uh, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. And Micah chapter 5 is where we'll begin, but in our studying and, and uh, exploring into this book this morning, there will be some teaching, um, warning you ahead of time, as well as preaching. Um, but uh, a little bit of overview of the book of Micah in order to get the context for why we go to this book. Um, in Matthew chapter two, some months ago when we started that series, we discovered how that the, at this time of the year, of course, you see the um, manger scenes where Jesus is, the baby Jesus is depicted as uh, lying in a manger and usually have some barnyard animals there and Mary and Joseph um, either kneeling or standing thereby, uh, nearby, as well as typically three wise men. <coughs> and we don't know exactly how many wise men were present in that uh, stable and where Jesus um, is depicted lying in a manger. Um, but because three gifts are mentioned, there in the book of Matthew, then many people assume there were only three wise men or magi who came uh, from the east looking for um, he who was to be king of the Jews, our savior, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we find that as those magi entered Jerusalem, we believe that they were influenced by Daniel, Mordecai and others that were there under the influence of the media Persian Empire, uh, Daniel especially being under the influence of Nebuchadnezzar, and, uh, the eunuch that had taken him in. But it wasn't just that they were influenced by the Babylonians or the media Persian Empire. We believe with all our hearts that the Jews that were taken captives in Babylon and then later when the media Persian uh, Empire conquered the Babylonians that we believe that the Jews took scriptures with them. We believe that Daniel and Mordecai and others influenced the media Persians and no doubt I encouraged many of them to embrace the truth that the Messiah would come one day and that Jehovah God was the one true and living God and that they needed a savior and they too looked forward to a Messiah and began to worship uh, the one true and living God and look forward to a savior coming who would take away their sins. And so under the direction of the Lord, these three magi or more came from the east looking for the savior, believing, following a star that was no doubt miraculously put there by the Lord that guided them to Jerusalem. And they may not have been as informed as they wanted to be 
and but they were pretty accurate and they inquired as to where specifically this Christ child would be and so the scribes and the Pharisees the chief priests and the elders were more learned in the scriptures than King Herod was placed there as the Roman governor uh, assigned there by Caesar and so he inquired of the Jewish scholars and uh, inquired of the chief priests who would know the scriptures, the scribes who would know the scriptures intricately. And they knew immediately what the Old Testament said about the birth of the Savior. So they opened the Old Testament scrolls and went straight <coughs> to the scroll that contained the writings of the prophet Micah and went straight to this portion of scripture that you have opened before you this morning in Micah chapter 5. And if you're able, out of respect for the reading of God's word, let's begin reading in Micah chapter 5 and verse 1. This is exactly where the chief priests and the scribes took Herod and took those magi and they read from this portion of scripture just as we are doing this morning. We'll only read through verse 5 but begin with me. In fact, we'll only read through the first line of verse 5. But let's begin reading. I'll read out loud if you'll follow along silently, starting in verse 1. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. Now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth, and this man shall be the peace. I'll read again the first line of verse 5. And this man shall be the peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word this morning. You indeed are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And those magi that came from the east, guided by the star you put in the heavens, guided by your spirit to, spe <coughs> to sp <coughs> specifically come at the perfect time, to arrive at the perfect time in Jerusalem, to inquire from the perfect ones, to guide them more specifically to the exact location of the birth of our Savior, the Messiah, the Christ child, the Son of the living God, God in the flesh. You, Heavenly Father, in the flesh, in the form of your Son, you, Lord Jesus, guided by you, Holy Spirit, so that they could witness the fact that the Savior had been born and tell the world. Thank you for this great gift, gracious gift that we celebrate all year long, but especially at this time of the year when the world is listening. Even those who don't want to hear, but they are still listening and can't help but hear what was going is going on. Help us as your people speak loudly, but lovingly and graciously to this lost world that is around us. There, there is a Savior that loves them and will bring peace that they have so often looked for, but has escaped them. They've looked in all the wrong places. But Lord, help us to point this lost world, this dark world, to the peace that they want, to the light that they need, to the truth. 
of a Savior who loves them and has mercy and grace that they so desperately need and the truth that they so desperately need. If there's anybody here today that does not know you as their Savior, I pray that today would be the day they'd come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated if you would, please. I'm going to hasten quickly and go through much of what we go through today and perhaps at another time if God would allow us we will look at more of these scriptures and um, when we have uh, more time to uh, study them more deeply but before we get back into Micah 5 2 and these other passages I want to take you back to Micah chapter 1 and I want to tell you what I'm going to tell you and then I'll tell you and then hopefully tell you what I told you. But the Lord has inspired Micah to give us three messages in these seven chapters that comprise the prophecy of the Lord through my, Micah. And these three messages are this. Number one, judgment is coming. Number two, because of that judgment, a deliverer is coming. And you might well guess that is our Savior, the Lord Jesus. But number three, because of all that, judgment is coming and the deliverer is coming. You need to trust the Lord. Simple messages. Judgment is coming. A deliverer is coming and you need to trust the Lord now, basically. I forgot that last word, now. Because that judgment is coming and it is severe and it is swift because of the sins of the nation of Israel and the sins of the whole world, really. And the deliverer, though. God is a wonderful God, but He is a just God. Um, steal a little bit of my own thunder here or the Lord's thunder in Scripture. When God says, be holy for I am holy, He means business. He's not just messing around. The whole world seems to think that they've got all the time in the world to get things right with God. And He starts off this message with Micah. In fact, let's just get right into it and not waste any more time. Starting in Micah chapter 1, I'll point this out. Starting in verse 2, see that word hear? That's important. We could also use the word listen. How many times have I remembered growing up my dad or my mom, I think especially my mom, I hear her words ringing in my ear. Listen to me. You're not listening. Hear what I'm saying. And how many times have my wife or I repeated those words to our children? And how many of you, I guess, show me your hands if you've repeated those words to your children. Listen to me. You're not hearing me. <laughs> Now I want you to go over to chapter 3 and listen, if you would, to the words of the Lord in verse 1. And I said, hear, I pray you. Now go over to chapter 6, if you would, and verse 1. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. I point those three instances out because those are the that those three places and locations are the beginning of each of the three messages that God has for His people through the prophet Micah. Three messages. Judgment is coming and He says, Hear, listen, judgment is coming. Chapter 3, Hear, listen to me. A deliverer is coming. 
and number uh, third message in starting in chapter six trust the Lord now listen to me this is serious business but go back to chapter one with me starting in verse two and let's read those next three or four verses starting in chapter two hear all you people hearken O earth and all that therein is, let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him. And the valleys shall be cleft as um, wax before the fire and as the waters that are poured down a steep place for the transgression of Jacob is all this. In other words, that's why this is happening. For the transgression of Jacob is all this. And for the sins of the house of Israel, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? That's the capital of the northern um, kingdom of Israel. And what are the high places of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel? Are they not Jerusalem? That's the capital of the southern kingdom. In other words, uh, judgment is coming and it's not going to be a respecter of the northern or the southern half of the nation of Israel. It's going to fall upon both um, uh, halves, the north and the south. And it's going to come swiftly. It's going to come severely. And so God is warning them of judgment coming. And indeed in 722 B.C., as Micah is predicting, and he does. I'm saving us a little bit of time here because of the enormity of these seven chapters and the inability of us to get into everything that's said here in the time we have a lot of this morning. But Micah does predict that the nation of Assyria does come, and indeed it did happen during Micah's day. He, is a, he prophesies during the same time as Hosea, during the same time as Amos, and during the same time as Isaiah. And Isaiah predicts it as well. And Assyria does come down heavy-handed upon the northern kingdom of Israel and takes them captive in 722 B.C., Sennacherib being their king. And he takes probably some 50,000 Jews back to Assyria, transplants them, and then brings tens of thousands, scores of thousands of Assyrians back to um, uh, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel and causes them to intermarry and causes them to mix their worship of uh, the idols coming from Assyria with Jehovah God and their worship. And intermarrying, it causes a mess. And Samaria is the northern kingdom's capital and that's where we get the Samaritans because they're half Jew and they're half Gentile. That's where that came about. And so it is it, it is a big mess. And so it's all predicted and this judgment falls upon them um, and it, it's, it's just a big mess. And so um, um, it's like God coming as a judge. The judge gets into the courtroom and he enters the chamber and everybody in the courtroom rises because the judge has come into the chamber as a symbol of respect out of the judge, for the judge, <coughs> excuse me, and the law that he represents. And, um, but no judge ever came like Micah is describing here as he comes uh, to pass judgment on the northern uh, tribes of Israel. Um, the verb to come forth here means to come forth for battle. And so this judge comes into court and he become, he starts cleaning house, so to speak, and he declares war on his own people. And he sees that justice is done. And um, the judge, um, uh, nobody's allowed to take sides and God comes to judge these nations uh, or these tribes that belong to him. And he comes to uh, split the mountains and melt them as it says here, as he says, the mountains shall be molten under him and the valleys shall be cleft as wax before the fire in verse four and the waters that are poured down um, into a steep place. Um, and God points in verse five, uh, his accusations 
at his own people, Israel and Judah both. They're both guilty. And so, um, both guilty of idolatry and worshiping these false gods. Now, um, we could go into greater detail and see what's going on here, uh, but to save a little time and get along with what's happening here and get further um, into here, look with me starting in chapter 2 and we get into more detail of the accusation of these sins starting in verse 1. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because in the power of uh, excuse me, but, uh, because it is in the power of their hands. Here's, and now they start getting into great detail. So they get on their beds at night. They decide what they're going to do in their evil plans and schemes. They get up in the morning and they put their evil plans and schemes to practice. And here's what they do, starting in verse 2. And they covet fields and they take them by violence and houses and take them away so they oppress a man and his house even a man and his heritage. Now that's important. What was God's plan when he brought Israel into the promised land? Through Joshua and his leaders beside him, they divided up the land. And he put out the law. And he says, you're going to work this land, you're going to farm this land, and you're going to let it rest on the seventh year. And every 49 years, we're going to have a year of Jubilee. Now, God saw and he looked ahead and he saw, now some of you are going to sell that land and so on and so forth. But on that seventh year, or the year of excuse me, Jubilee, it's going to go back to the original owner. I'm not going to allow, God says, for these wealthy landowners to just take over and make people poor by uh, coming in and running roughshod over people and swallowing up land and um, um, hundreds of thousands of acres and scores of thousands of acres and just making people poor and then the poor people that were already poor making them even more poor. I'm not going to allow that to happen. So you're going to forgive those debts every seven years and then it's also on the year of Jubilee it's especially going to happen. I'm going to make sure that that kind of um, taking advantage of people doesn't take place. You know what I mean? And because that's the kind of thing that's going on today. That's the very same thing that God saw that he was going to prevent. And of course, um, if we went by God's laws, it wouldn't be going on today. But it is going on today. And so right here in the book of Micah, it was going on. And he says they coveted the fields and they were taken by violence and houses and they take them away so they oppress a man in his house even a man in his heritage and therefore thus saith the Lord behold against this family do I devise an evil from which they shall not remove your necks neither shall you go haughtily for this is for this time is evil in that day shall one take up a parable against you and lament with a doleful lamentation verse 4 and say we be utterly spoiled he hath changed the portion of my people how hath he removed it from me and turning away he hath divided our fields therefore thou shalt have none uh, that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord um, and, and let's stop right there so what was he saying God says, you won't obey my law. You won't forgive their debt at, on the seventh year. You won't honor the ju year of Jubilee. You won't give back their land. So I'll take back their land. I'll take your land from you. I'll ship you off to Assyria. And later on in the book of Micah, Isaiah and others, at Hosea, they prophesied Babylon's going to come in and a hundred years later, and to you, Judah, you're going to, because you wouldn't practice what I told you to practice, you're going to be shipped off to Babylon for 70 years. You wouldn't give back the land. You took advantage of people. You made them poor. You took advantage of the people that were already poor. And you wouldn't forgive their debts, like I said, on the seventh year. So you, you, you want to see how it's like to take land from people and become poor? You like worshiping idols? I'll show you idols. I'll take you to the center of idolatry. I'll take you over to Babylon. I'll take you over to Assyria. So God took their land from them. 
and made them poor and took them to land of idol worship and caused them to see what it was like. And that's what God did. And um, they were in great straits and they were in great hurt and pain and suffering because they wouldn't listen to God. God wanted to bless them. God had a perfect plan on how they could be blessed of God and enjoy the riches of that land and see a bountiful harvest and see a land blessed, you know, but they wouldn't listen to the Lord. So God says, uh, message number one, judgment is coming and has come swiftly. He said, be holy as I am holy. And he meant business, but they didn't listen. They didn't listen to God's prophets. They didn't listen to Micah. They didn't listen to Isaiah. They didn't listen to Hosea. They didn't <coughs> listen to Amos. And uh, so that's why he said, here, I pray you. Listen, remember when you were telling your children, listen to me, listen to me. You're not hearing me. Well, that's what God says to us. That's what God says to us in our walk with him. And when we read in his words, don't go there. Separate from the world. You're not hearing me. Uh, I want to talk to you about what's going on in your life. That's going to ruin your life. That's going to bring um, uh, destruction to your home and to your children. Maybe not today. Maybe when they get to be seven and eight years old or 10 and 12 years old or teenagers. Maybe when they leave home, <coughs> maybe when you see it happening in their own homes and their own marriages, but you're not hearing me. I told you not to bring that into the home. I warned you. Remember when the preacher was preaching on that? Remember when you read that in your Bible? Remember when you heard that message on the radio? I was warning you, hear me, listen to me. I was trying to warn you. That's why God says, hear, listen. And you'll see that word over and over and over from Genesis to Revelation. And God's trying to warn us and gently and tenderly speak to us through his word in a still small voice. But God tells us, as he told the people of Israel and Judah, his people, hear me, I said in verse and, and throughout here. And he says in verse 6, Prophesy ye not, say they to them. Prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them. They shall not um, take shame. O thou that uh, art named the house of Jacob, and the Spirit of the Lord straightened. Um, uh, excuse me. Let me say that again. O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the Spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Even of late my people is risen up as an enemy. You pull off the road with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. The women of my people have you cast out from their pleasant houses and from their children have you taken away my glory forever. Arise ye and depart for this is not your rest, because it is polluted, it shall destroy you even with a sore destruction. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. In other words, here's what they were doing. They were ignoring what God was saying. When he was saying, hear ye, listen to me. Instead, they picked people men who would prophesy for food and drink. That's what it ends up being at the end of these 11 verses, around verse 10 and 11. If they would offer them some wine or strong drink and a meal, they would prophesy and tell them what they wanted to hear, basically. They were, they were preaching and prophesying and filling in those positions for a living to make money for a paycheck. And they knew that if they told the people what they wanted to hear, that paycheck would keep coming. 
But the true man of God, like Micah, wouldn't let that happen. He wouldn't about to preach for a paycheck or for a salary. He was going to stand up, be the man of God, and tell them what God told him to say, regardless of whether he got paid or not. He knew who his resource was, and that was the Lord. And they could pay him or not. They could like it or not. He could be popular or unpopular or not. Here's what he said, starting, and I'll get to this in a minute. But the second message was not about judgment, but was, well, it started to be a little bit about judgment, but they said a deliverer is coming. That's the second message, starting in chapter 3 and verse 1. He begins to talk about the sins of the leaders. Listen, starting in verse 1, he says again of chapter 3, And I said, Here I pray you, O heads of Jacob, the leaders, starting with the princes, who are the princes? That be their political leaders, the king, the princes of the, of the you princes of the house of Israel. Is not is it not for you to know judgment? Should you know justice and what is right and what is wrong? And should you know the difference? And verse two, you're the you hate good and love evil. Love the evil. That was the condition of the leader's heart in the day that Micah was. Uh, preaching and prophesying. You hate the good and love the evil. Does that sound familiar of politicians? Any politicians you know? And any faces or names come to mind in the day and age here in California, across the nation? You love good, or excuse me, you uh, hate the good and love the evil who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones. This is speaking about the people that they are leading, their constituents the citizenry that they are over, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and they uh, break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. And I don't think that they were doing this literally, but this is figuratively how they were treating the people. Fleecing would be a kind way to put it, but this would be <coughs> a more... Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? This would be uh, kind of a more a colorful way to put it. Verse 3, Who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin off them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces. As for the pot and flesh within the cauldron, they shall cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at the time as they behave themselves ill in their doings. Thus saith the Lord, verse 5, concerning the prophets. Now he's getting not on the princes, but the prophets. These are the preachers. They're in bad shape too, spiritually speaking. The prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry, Peace, and he that putteth not their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Therefore night shall be unto you, that ye shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you, and that ye <clears throat> shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. In other words, God's not giving you anything. You have no light in you. You're not getting anything from God, you prophets. Everything's darkness to you. You have no vision. But then... Micah speaks up in verse 8 and says, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment, and of might, to declare unto Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. I have no problem telling Jacob and Israel uh, uh, what they're guilty of. I'll tell them to their face what their sin is, and what their transgressions are, and where they're going wrong. That's what a prophet should do. He has should no problem preaching the truth and and naming sin. Any preacher worth a dime, worth their salt, should not be afraid of naming sin in any day and age. And all God's people said, Amen. And the day that I stop naming sin and am afraid to uh, call it like it is, you need to get a new preacher. That's the truth. 
Verse 9. Hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob. So now he's, Micah has told it like it was. He's named the princes, the political leaders. He's named the prophets, the preachers, who are blowing it in his day. And now he's combining them in one you know, basket, so to speak. He calls them just the heads of the house of Jacob, and the princes of the house of Israel, and that abhor judgment or justice. They're not doing right by the people. And they're perverting all equity. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with inequity. Oh, they're building Zion all right and perverting all equity. I don't know if you've seen any cartoons, political cartoons lately, but there's certain political leader that certain cartoonists in the news today keep putting with blood on his hands. That's exactly what this is saying right here. I'll read it again. Verse 10, they build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Verse 11, the heads thereof judge for reward and the priests thereof teach for hire and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet they will lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Micah just tells it like it is. Zion is in this shape because of all you leaders. Everything rises or falls on leadership. That's what he's saying. And he's just telling it like it is. Uh, over there and so the sins of the leaders and he gets off and he's talking about this but let's go on over and chapter 4 I'm just gonna here, here's the deal he has come down the Lord through Micah and he's been really pointed about warning about judgment coming and why judgment is coming and then the promise of a deliverer coming but in the first part of chapter 3 and talking about the promise in this message that's covering chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5 is the promise of a deliverer coming. But the first part of chapter 3, when he's telling him, listen to me, a deliverer is coming, but the sins of the leaders are responsible for that judgment that's been there. But then he, he comes in chapter 4 and says, look, this nation still has a great future ahead of it. I know this sounds bad, and judgments can become swift and severe, but I don't want you to lose all hope. Look with me in the beginning of verse four, or chapter four. But in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and the people shall flow into it and many nations shall come and say come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem for he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off and they shall bear their, excuse me, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation shall not lift up sword against na nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That verse is, that passage is also in Isaiah. I, I mentioned to you before that they prophesied in the same time frame. They were, um, they lived at the same time. And God inspired both of them to say virtually the same thing. Which came first? I don't know. It doesn't matter. They were both inspired of the Holy Spirit of God. So, <clears throat> to me, the debate is mute. Is it's a moot point. It doesn't matter. They both came from the Lord. So that passage is quoted. It's at the United Nations in New York City. What people don't realize is that taking instruments of war and melting them down 
and remolding them into instruments of peace, farming and agriculture um, instruments uh, to farm with is going to happen one day and there will be world peace but man is not going to bring it about the Lord brings it about so in all this that Isaiah prophesied all this that Micah prophesied will come about and what he's doing is he's giving the people hope in this blasting the people for their wickedness and their idolatry and warning them severely and not pulling any punches. The judgment's going to come swift. It's going to come severe. But he said, listen, there is hope. One day the Lord will return and come with singing and everlasting joy will be yours once again. And the instruments of war will be melted down and re molded into instruments of peace when the Lord comes and his with his law he will rule and he will sit on his throne and there will be everlasting peace and everlasting joy when he comes and he tells us it's a future time it's not for their time right then when he's prophesying this it's off in the future and we know because God's privileged us to have the entire canon of Scripture. He's allowed us to have 66 books. We call the one book Holy Scripture, the entire Bible. We know that's during the millennial reign of Christ on earth. And it comes after the rapture and after the tribulation period. And if Christ should come while we're sitting here this morning, that millennial reign of Christ will begin in just seven short years from right now, if Christ should come while we're sitting here. We don't know when that will be, though. So I don't want to spend any more time here this morning, but God took time to speak through Micah while he was telling them of severe judgment for their wickedness, to tell them, look, but there is hope if you're willing to repent. There's even more hope for right now. But in the future, God has a wonderful plan for the nation of Israel and for all the world. But right here, starting in chapter 5, he tells them of another hope that will happen much sooner. In verse 1 of chapter 5, he begins to tell them of deliverer coming. But first he tells them of something that happens much sooner. Verse 1 of chapter 5 reads, Now gather thyself in troops right now, he's saying. Right now. Gather now, gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us, the Lord, that is through the coming conqueror. They shall smite the judge of Israel, speaking of one of the kings of Israel, with a rod upon the cheek. It was a great insult to smite any ruler who was to be respected and revered, but especially upon the cheek, from which judgment came, from which edicts came, from which directives and orders came. To smite them upon the cheek was a tremendous insult. As it turned out, this was fulfilled when Zedekiah, king of the southern kingdom of Judah, was rebellious against Nebuchadnezzar, thought he could go against God's uh, command to submit to Nebuchadnezzar. And he tried to rebel against him and Nebuchadnezzar came over and in short order handled Zedekiah and Zedekiah smote him upon the cheek, took him off the throne, in front of him slaughtered his sons and then put out his eyes and took him captive back to Babylon where he lived out his days. Last thing he saw was the 
slaughtering of his own sons before he was um, had his eyes gouged out by Nebuchadnezzar. It was a great insult to Zedekiah. And that speaks of Zedekiah. But starting in verse 2, God prophesied through Micah another hope for Israel. And this is where, when the Magi came from the east, inquiring where the Messiah would be born, more specifically, the exact location, and inquired of Herod, and Herod summoned the chief priests and the scribes because the Magi said it's in Scripture. We know it's there. The chief priest then summoned the scroll of Micah. They unrolled that scroll before Herod, and the scribes and the chief priests read before Herod, and they said, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, verse 2 of chapter 5 of Micah, but thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler of Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Oh, wow. It identifies the birthplace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Micah prophesied this under the direction of the Holy Spirit 700 years before the birth of Christ. And now it's revealed, and these magis revealed that they had been led of a star that God showed them in the heavens. And that they felt that this was the time that the Messiah was to be born and that they felt that the Messiah was now alive on earth who was to be king of the Jews. They told Messiah, we'll not go to Matthew chapter 2, but it is printed there under the direction of the Holy Spirit who inspired Micah to write these words, inspired Matthew to write those words, and inspired the Magi to speak those words before Herod and the chief priests and the scribes. And at this time of the year, we celebrate the birth of the Savior. And it was revealed here 700 years before his birth where he would be born. Bethlehem meaning house of, house of bread. And Ephratah meaning fruitful. There was another Bethlehem way to the north in Israel. But this was specifically not just Bethlehem, but Bethlehem Ephratah about six miles to the southwest of Jerusalem, there was this little bitty village where King David was born. And Joseph and Mary dutifully, under orders of the Roman government, were ordered to go back to the town that was they were belonging to and was their hometown. And they were of the line of David and it was where they were to be counted in the census and where they were to pay their taxes to the Roman government. And so they had gone there to be submissive to the Roman government and to not cause any trouble for themselves or others. And they had gone there and found that, of course, as you know, the story goes, there was no room for them in any inn where they could take refuge as others had. So they found refuge in a stable there in Bethlehem. And it was time for Mary to be delivered of her child. That at that time they <laughs> had no ultrasounds. They had no way of telling whether it was a boy or a girl, except for the angel Gabriel who had revealed to Mary it's better than an ultrasound. God is always right every time he revealed to Mary through Gabriel that she would be delivered of a son that she would be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost that she would give birth to the Messiah coming from the line of David as she was in the line of David and this son would be called Jesus for he shall save his people from his sins Emmanuel being God with us as was revealed to Joseph as well. And sure enough, as this was revealed to the Magi, Herod connivingly and evilly lied and 
pretended to want to worship the Christ child as well and told the Magi, go and find him, and then when you found him, return and tell me where he is so that I might come and worship him as well. We're told here in Micah 5 too, not only a specific location of Jesus' birth, it says that out of Judah, out of this Bethlehem, Ephratah, out of this small, obscure little village, would come forth unto me, that is unto the Lord, to be a ruler in Israel, whose going forth had been from old, from every, from everlasting. Every prophet, beginning in Moses, had told of this Messiah to be born. It was nothing new. Every Jew who knew the scriptures had been passing this down from generation to generation that a Messiah was coming to deliver them and he would rule and reign on earth and this would be God in the flesh from the line of David the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And they would hope that he would deliver him from their oppressors at this time, the Roman government. And they looked forward to that. They didn't know all the rest of the details of God's plan, but they believed that would happen. They didn't know all the other details. But he would be from old, from everlasting. He would be God in the flesh. He would be God. He would be deity. Oh, my goodness, was Herod ever in for a surprise? In the scriptures we read here, let me catch up to my notes. We find that this Christ child coming, he, yes, was the coming Messiah. He was the one to become ruler of the Jew <coughs> Jews. He uh, was more than that though. He was to become the savior of all mankind. He was the promised child. Um, definite article um, coming from Abraham um, uh, and Sarah um, through Isaac and uh, Jacob. And um, he was uh, definitely uh, to be this one who would take away the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. And so we come and we find, um, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, catch up with my notes here. Yeah. So now Micah looks ahead and sees that um, this, um, in this prophecy where Micah reveals these facts about the Messiah being the eternal God and that his days have come from everlasting from all of eternity but while he is truly God he is truly man and born this son of man son of God we have this miracle birth the incarnation in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He could have been born in bigger cities, more ornate cities, but He was to be born of a lowly birth. And all the more would His greatness, His holiness stand out the Holy Son of God radiating with all the glory of God in human flesh. He walked this earth a sinless life. He was the perfect Son of God. Integrity, perfect. Honesty, perfect. Love, perfect. Mercy, Enduring forever as high as the heavens, filling all space. Grace that's matchless. Truth. Came in truth. Bearing the fact that God 
has sent his son to die on the cross. That truth to pay for all the sins of mankind. But mankind would have to accept that truth. That they are indeed sinners. And before they could have the grace that he would offer, they would first have to accept his truth. That they are the sinners. It's a harsh reality. Everyone wants peace. Everyone wants joy. Everyone wants happiness and contentment. They want all the grace that God has to give them. And while some are nominally willing to acknowledge that they've messed up along the way and have made some mistakes, quite often mankind is not willing to accept the fact that the mistakes they've made and the sins they've committed have consequences. And that they must reap what they sow. And that God says there indeed are eternal consequences for our sins. Man would rather not face God for their sins. In the end times we're told that when God returns in the person of his son and in all his glory and all his angels appear with him and that when lost man sees the Lord Jesus Christ come in all his glory that they will try to hide from the Lord Jesus Christ and they will cry out and ask for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them rather than look into the face, the holy face of the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than face the Lord in their sins. They would rather have rocks and mountains fall on them than face him with their sins. It is human nature to want to not have to deal with the reality of our own evil deeds quite often. I you know as a child growing up when I would get caught with something, whether it be a lie or having disobeyed or not obeyed or something, it was a terrible, horrible feeling to have to face my dad or my mom and have to own up to something or not face the consequences of what was coming. It's a horrible, horrible, terrible thing. We can only imagine as human beings, and I think all of us have been there and done that, but not just for the fact of letting them down, but to have to face the consequences and the punishment that was coming. How much more sore punishment is it to think about and have to face a holy God or the punishment that is separation from him in a place called hell than to face ourselves and our own sin that we'd rather not think about. It's a horrible thing to think about. But what Micah was trying to say is yes, the Judgment is coming for their sins, and it's severe and it's swift. But he was trying to say that the second message which hear me, a deliverer is coming. The Messiah is coming. And he wanted to let them know that. But look over to chapter 6 with me real quick. In verse 1. Chapter 6 says, Again, here, listen to me. You heard me when I said judgment was coming and it was severe and swift. You heard me when I said a deliverer is coming. But now hear this. Hear now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend you before the mountains and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, ye strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord hath the controversy with his people. Yes, that's true. 
and he will plead with Israel. I'm trying to tell you something. Verse 3, O my people, what have I done unto thee? Wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. In other words, what have I done to you where I have let you down? Trust me now is what he's trying to say. Listen as I read, starting and continuing in verse 4. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of thy servants. Have I treated you right in the past? Have I um, sent before thee Moses and Aaron and Aaron and Miriam? And O oh, my people, remember now what Balak king of Moab consulted and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him from Shinnom unto Gilgal that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Wherewith, verse 6, shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers? Micah is saying rivers of oil. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but do but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before thy humbly with thy God. <coughs> He's trying to say, Trust me now, Israel and Judah. I've never let you down. Look at chapter 7 and verse 1. Woe is me, for I am um, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits and as the grape clings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desire the first ripe fruit. The good man has perished out of the earth and there is none upright uh, um, among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. What is he saying? My people are in bad shape. But listen, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. This is the end of the story. He's saying this is you heard me when the message was the judgment is severe and swift. You heard me when I said I'm delivering to you this message that there is a, um, a deliverer is coming. And I told you it's the Messiah. He came out of Bethlehem, Ephra. he's coming out of Bethlehem, Ephrata. Now look to the very last part of chapter 7. Start with me in verse 18. Who is God? like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy he will turn again he will have compassion on us he will subdue our iniquities and the, and will cast all their sins into the depth of the sea what is he saying Yes, I'm going to judge your sins severely and swift. But I'm going to send a deliverer. And he told them it was Jesus coming out of Bethlehem, Ephrata. The Magi came and it came true. Micah's prophecy was fulfilled. Jesus was born 700 years later. It happened. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has come. He was born. He walked this earth. He died on the cross. He paid for our sins. And the same is still true today. God will still judge sins severely and swiftly. But the message is still also the same. The Messiah not only will come, He has come. A deliverer has come. And the last message is also still true. Trust the Lord now. He'll cast your sins into the depths of the sea. He's merciful. He's gracious. He wants to forgive you. He wants to save you. He wants to put you. Isaiah, who prophesied at the same time as Micah, he even added more to it. He not only said what Micah said, that he cast your sins into the depths of the sea, but he added this. He'll remember them no more. He'll remember them no more. Corey Tenboom, she and her family helped hide Jews during World War II when Nazi Germany, under the command of Hitler, were trying to eradicate Jews. Corey Tenboom and her family were hiding Jews in their home. 
they eventually got caught and were sent to concentration camps. All of Corey Ten Boom's family died in those camps with the exception of she herself. After the war was over, she finally died at the age of 104 down in the Los Angeles area. Before she died, she was pondering this verse in this passage in Isaiah. And she said, not only will God forgive your sins and cast them into the deepest sea behind his back and remember them no more, he'll put up a no fishing sign. What I'm trying to say is, is that Micah's complete message that God gave him was that God does judge sin, but he loves us so much, he sent his son to be a deliverer. He wants us in heaven with him. So he sent his son, caused him to be born in Bethlehem, as Micah predicted. It did happen. He was born, lived a sinless life. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. Was buried and rose again the third day. And he'll forgive your sins. And they'll be buried in the deepest sea behind his back. He'll remember them no more. And they'll never be brought up. If you'll trust him as Savior. And you can share that message as Micah, as the Lord had Micah share it with us. He can share that message with everyone this time of the year who needs to hear it. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And no one looking around. You're here today.